Hello, 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 everybody. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's Inside the Rookery. Uh, you might notice you've got a different host today. Lindsay has the night off. Uh, she's manning the, the chat, actually, uh, and I'm taking over hosting duties. So welcome to those of you who are watching us live on, on Twitch, <coughs> YouTube, Facebook, or platform of choice, and also to those of you catching up afterwards on YouTube. Uh, I'm joined tonight uh, by a couple of my fellow rooks. We've got Andy Law and Graham. And we also, as always, have our special guest, which this week is Jonathan Green here to talk to us about game books and um, so Hello. jonathan will pop up uh, a lovely little advert here um of some here. of your uh products and uh, if you'd like to maybe just give us a little introduction tell us a little bit about yourself before we get started okay um my name's jonathan green and i'm probably best known as a north of, Advent of adventure game books i actually started out by writing my first commission fighting fancy game book 30 years ago this summer uh and that was published in 1993, and I'm fortunate enough to have been published every year since. So I wrote seven game books in the Fighting Fantasy series between Puffin Books and also when they came back with Wizard Books. Um, I've been involved in the series since Scholastic started publishing it with the, helping the guest authors get a handle on how to write game books. But I now mainly write my own Ace Game Book series, which is taking everything I learned from writing Fighting Fantasy um, and applying it to my own adventures. But they're all uh, reimaginings of existing works of literature so some are closer to the original source material than others uh, for example uh, the next one to come out hopefully this summer is ronin 47 mm. which is based on the legend of the 47 ronin from japan yeah. but it's a future dystopian um, mechs versus kaiju adventure so that obviously diverges massively from the source material <laughs> <laughs> the most recently published is dracula curse of the vampire which is an interactive retelling of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And that's very oh, close nice. to the original, but with expanded elements. And the idea in that is that you can play as one of the vampire hunters. So Jonathan Harker, Mina Murray, Dr. Seward, or you can play the story from Dracula's point of view and try and defeat the vampire hunters. Oh. Nice. It's cunning, yeah, so isn't it? Oh, I've missed all sorts of bits in the middle, but anyway, that, that's, that's me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I know you from, uh, you You wrote what was at the time the definitive uh, history of game books as an art. Yeah, well, Fighting Fancy Ones, yes. That uh, yeah. came out in 2014, the first volume. And there was a second volume a few years later, which added the bits I'd missed the first time around. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, and we might come back to that later in this discussion, I guess. <laughs> Fair enough. Very good. All right, well, let, let's get started with our, our first question here. Um, so this is from Jester, who's asking, how do you think that um, choose your own adventure type books have changed since you began reading slash writing them? I'm, I suppose perhaps it might be worth discussing how long a difference that is, like when you began reading them to when you started writing them yeah. as well. How long have we got to talk about this? Three weeks? Um, <laughs> <Whole hour. laughs> I first encountered them in the, it must have been the early 80s in the school library slash bookshop, but it was the choose your own adventure books, which were the American ones. So oh, they are okay. just branching narrative. There is no game to beat. It's pure chance. And the story can diverge massively. Uh, mm. What I read not that long ago, bizarrely, is the one where about the abominable snowman. And that goes off in all sorts of tangents. But it means nothing seems to ever link up. So it really yeah. is a branching diagram. And the stories, as a result, can be very short. But then you can yeah. go back and try a different route. So it's really just reading them and seeing what else could have happened. There's no kind yeah, of quest yeah. to complete. Mm. Whereas the next ones I was aware of myself were fighting fantasy. And the Warlock of Fartup Mountain came out in 1982. And I think I'd been dragged into Bath to buy new school shoes or something. And my mum took pity on me and, and at the end said I could go to the bookshop. And I remember it still being on the table and it being like nothing I'd seen before. The layout of the cover, the subject mm -hmm. material. And then when I opened it and you saw Russ Nicholson's grotesque artwork, it was just fantastic. And I thought, I've got to have this. Mm. And I've never looked back. Um, so that obviously, that was then became a solo role play adventure. And you had to try and beat it. And the books were sold on the premise that there's only one way through and you've got to find it. So that was how I kind of learned about adventure game books and what they could be. So when I first started writing them just for fun, and then when I was commissioned, I followed the same pattern where you have one route and the trouble is i was you know the arrogance of youth by the time i was writing them i'd stopped playing them fairly myself so i cheated 
I didn't bother rolling <laughs> dice. I didn't bother fighting the monsters because I wanted to read the story. <laughs> so I then wrote books for people like me to try and stop them. And of course, forgot that that can take the fun out of it for the people who are trying to play fairly. So yeah. there are some well-publicized flaws in my early endeavors. But then uh, I wrote three books for Puffin, all of which are incredibly hard and probably all have nasty, unfair bugs in them. But then uh, the internet happened and I read what people thought about them and got a bit more distance with myself. And when I came back and started writing for Wizard Books, there's a weird one where Blood Bones was written for Puffin but published by Wizard. So it was tweaked a bit, but not massively. But when I started writing other ones like Howl of the Werewolf, I was trying to make them fair because I thought you have to play by the rules that you've established. So you've got to be completely fair for those people who want to play fairly. And if people want to cheat, it's a compliment because they're enjoying the story and they want to find out what happens next. Yeah. Um, so even the concept of it being cheating, I think it's just another way of enjoying the book. I don't think mm -hmm. you have to make oh, things yeah. wrong. So. Um, so that's the approach I take now. It's interesting because sometimes the criticisms I get now in my books are too easy. Uh, <laughs> the, the other thing that I've noticed, and it's not just me who's done this, but for example, if you take Destiny Quest by Michael J. Ward that came out, I'm trying to think how long ago it was now. It might be as much as 10 years. I'm not sure. But uh, when he first started publishing those, they'd clearly been influenced by video games because when Fighting Fantasy ended and sort of Lone Wolf wound up for a little bit, people kept using the argument, well, they don't compete with video games and computer games. And I'm not convinced that that's the case because in France, they've never gone out of print. Um, but obviously people played video games. They went back to writing game books. And something like Destiny Quest is very much influenced by games like World of Warcraft. So a big part of that is collecting the right gear to defeat the different monsters. And you can choose the different challenges via a map of, so you've got your easy quest, your hard and your super hard. Uh, and you can have another go if you don't succeed. So that's very like a computer game. And in yeah. terms of my own, um, I don't have where's one true route. And it's not even a case of for each character, there's one true path. You can go all sorts of different ways. And there might be some major things you have to solve, but generally there'll be items that you can pick up which will help with an encounter, make it easier, but it's still possible to get through unless you make some horrendous flaw. And the other thing I've changed personally was those insta-death sections where turn left or turn right, you've got no clue which is which, turn left, how are you dead? So I yeah. avoid that. So if there is something like that coming up, I try and give people a second or maybe even a third chance. And by that point, you think, well, too bad. If you don't take the hints now, you deserve it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so in a very brief summary, I think, yeah, people, th th I don't know, there's something about them being books that is very different from video games still and which people enjoy. Uh, and not just in terms of practicality, because you can have games on your phone all the time. But I think mm. reading books, it's, it's never gone out of fashion. And the fact that there was some mad craze about e-readers and yet now you see the sales of hardbacks going up again because people are bibliophiles. They they love books. They love the experience of opening the book, smelling the book, reading it, even the feel of the paper. They decorate their rooms with books on their bookshelves. It makes statements about who they are, which you can't do with an e-reader. Very true. Absolutely. Um, Graham, have you got any other sort of insights to add there in terms of how you think these books have changed over the years? Um. Well, I haven't kept up with it, uh, the uh, state of the art, as much as John has. But, um, but yeah, uh, there were some very early attempts. I think the earliest one I ever found was from 1969, um, which had to do with international relations, if I remember correctly. Um, and they were the early Choose Your Owns, as you said. They advertised on the basis of how many different endings they offered, which is kind of a sort of a reverse selling point because <laughs> more, the more endings, the shorter the actual route through. Um, <laughs> but Fighting Fantasy, of course, changed everything when it came out. And there was a whole host of imitators at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, they gradually winnowed through and basically we got left with Fighting Fantasy and Lone Wolf as the ones who survived. Um, and as they've changed over time, I mean, I've seen the Wizard Books uh, versions come out. I've seen various attempts to put them on a, a mobile platform. And uh, yeah, I have to agree with you, John, that, that uh, you know, it's there's, there's no substitute for a book, something you can hold in your hand and uh you know flip back through um so uh, 
Yeah, and they just seem to keep going. And now we seem to have a second wave as uh, the children of the original fans are being introduced to them. And uh, it's just great. It doesn't seem like it'll ever end. It's interesting. Graham, so, th sorry, sorry, on, on you go. Um, just Graham talking about you know, the, the length of the Choose Your Adventure book has been quite short. Obviously, they were always marketed to children. And mm. that was their great strength because the stories could be quite short. And because... Yeah when you look at it, reading it through, you, you never had that idea of, well, I've only read this many pages, I've got this much to go, and that's too much for me. So Very if you started reading hard, it tricked you into reading more. And again, with Fighting Fans, mm. although they are longer, the sections are still relatively short. And I yeah. think that was what one of the major differences. And you always heard about reluctant readers, you know, really enjoy them. Absolutely, yeah. As well as everybody else. And the thing I think, another way they've changed is that those readers have grown up and have never stopped liking game books. So now you yep. do have ones which are aimed more directly at an adult market. So, for example, I yeah. would say with my Ace Game books, if you're a literate 10 year old, you can read them. And obviously, you've, if you've read the original, you'll get more out of the book, but it won't stop you enjoying it. But something yeah. like Dracula is not for children. You know, it's, no. it's an adult book. Absolutely. And it was always designed to be that. And even to the point where some of the sections are you know, pages long rather than just being a few lines. So that's another way that they've definitely nice. changed. Yeah, I'm very glad you brought up the subject of, of reluctant readers because uh, although I only wrote one fighting fantasy game book, I was uh, back in 1985 before I, I started work for Games Workshop. Um, I was contracted to write a series of 12 specifically for reluctant readers. Um, and uh, they were using the choose your own adventure format. So, uh, you know, many endings. Uh, although being influenced by game books, I tried to to uh, have at least a few that were, uh, you know, this is the, the way to succeed. They were quests. They weren't just see what happened kind of things. Um, and uh, yeah, I for a while there, I was really intrigued by the, the possibilities of the format for um, for training and education. But uh, it never seemed to take. Um, mm -hmm series that I wrote was published and rocketed from obscurity to oblivion. I've never even seen a copy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, literally, they never sent me any or anything. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of potential there, I thought at the time. Of course, it's all It's done. interesting uh, when you say like, it's always, although they're marketed to children, it, it is also a struggle to get them into schools, it seems to be still. And certainly yeah. they don't have the same selling power that they did in the 80s. But no. what's weird is that there is, or at least last time I looked, which is a long time ago, but there is a component of the English curriculum for primary school in the UK. Mm. So about sort of 10, 11 year olds, which includes interactive fiction. So it's oh, even well, catered yeah. for in, you know, in the format, although people maybe yeah. forgotten where it started because you know, there's so much interactive fiction in video games, obviously. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. also through audio books and all sorts of things now. Yeah. Yeah. In the 80s, it just wasn't seen as legitimate. Uh, you know, it was no. seen as very sort of niche for uh, for mm. kids who then grew up and played Dungeons and Dragons. And as far as the schools were concerned, because it was fantasy, it was not educational. Um, yeah. uh, there was a, a classic interview with Ian Livingstone. And I think he was on. I'm on mute. Saturday <laughs> or with, with John Craven, who talked mm. about these books. Then he said, when are you going to write a proper book? And exactly. That kind of, yeah. Like I say, that's it in a nutshell. People don't consider, or right, consider so them the real I have my point that I attempted to make three times whilst I was on mute, and <laughs> obviously nobody heard. Um, in my school, the exact opposite was the case. Um, oh. The teachers strongly drummed down hard on the benefits that fighting fantasy books in particular offered um, mm. because they were quite impressed by the ability of those books to drag in as was discussing earlier reluctant readers um mm. and that was largely because of people like myself my first one was death trap dungeon and um, which is why i brought that one out it has my handwriting in here from when i was about i don't know younger um <laughs> and uh there there was a real reaction because there was some very clear and obvious um benefits that these books were bringing and locally mm. the schools all went no we're going to push them hard and locally you got the little book club leaflets that you could buy books from um that you could send away and your parents spent money on and they pushed them very hard when i was young that's oh. good i think it's, yeah. it's like everything comes from the top so if the teachers enjoy it or see the value yes. of it because you still see, you see on Twitter now, that's the great thing, you get so much more engagement with the people who do that. And regularly there are people 
who will post the fighting fantasy Twitter uh, account mm. to say that no, they read them with their class or they're looking forward to reading a new book together with them, which is brilliant. Yeah. yeah. From and on that, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the dark room. If any of you have yes. encountered this, yeah. Um, so if you if you haven't, if anyone was watching it, um, it's really good. He does it on Twitch now as well, but it, it certainly began for me as a live show in the Edinburgh Fringe. But it's an Australian comedian who essentially does a choose your own adventure style adventure, but he does it using a complicated PowerPoint that he's made live with the audience, and he picks somebody out to make the decisions. And it, it's it's interesting because he is clearly riffing on the the popularity of them and the the kind of the, the cliches and conventions of the genre, including the the unpredictable fatality of it. Um, yeah. In that, you know, a recurring gag is whatever you choose, you, you die in a horrific way. And yeah. there is one way through, but it, it has almost never um, ever come mm. out during a, a live show. But the, the thing that I find most fascinating about that was in, in my head, because again, as a, as a teacher granted of, of older students I, I don't really see a lot of these in the school library although I have made a note to, to talk to the librarian uh, at the start of the next term but I was surprised when one of my students quite a young student in sort of P7 was was reading one purely because she had gone and seen the dark room in the Edinburgh Fringe and had enjoyed it so much and had discovered this was a whole genre of books and had suddenly got into to the whole kind of genre of books so um, it is interesting how they are still yeah very much spanning the spanning these and, and yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing when we talked about there's adults who were children back in the 80s. The thing is, some of them are movers and shakers. People like Charlie Brooker, mm. who wrote mm -hmm. um, Bandersnatch, obviously, you know, interactive TV program. And on an interview on TV, I saw him mention that one of his influences was the Warlock of Fartop Mountain. So, right. uh, and also, I've now forgotten the name of the guy, but the guy uh, designed Dark Souls. He, again, you know, used to love pouring over the Titan source book, apparently, for mm. fighting That was world. a phenomenally good source book. Um, yeah. When I was young, no, there was also an amazing piece of work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, when, when I was young, there was also um, a push from some writers to try and bridge <clears throat> into that market. For example, the "You Can Be the Stainless Steel Rat" by Harry Harrison, oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. who had who had taken that step and seen that there was a way of gaining access um, to customers that he would never have had access to before, and yeah. hopefully dragging them over towards his fiction. Um, yeah. And that was one that I read back when it was released, and that. That mm. sort of opened my that's... eyes to the fact that it wasn't just fighting fantasy for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And whilst there were other alternatives clearly on the market at that time, um, mm. I I never quite took them as official as Final Fantasy when I was a kid. <laughs> right. But, yeah. Um, uh, when real authors started coming along and saying, "Hey, we're doing this too," it, it just mm. broke that particular window wide open. Mm. Yeah, because yeah, um, Pat Mills wrote the Slain one, didn't he, for 2018, yeah. I think. Yeah, I there was a lost killer story or something. Each week ended with a, a mini kind of game book, which you could play through. And uh, oh. Kim Newman, postmodernist horror author and film critic, wrote Life's Lottery, which mm -hmm. is, uh, I, again, I don't think there's any mechanics in that, but it's, you know, no. it's still interactive fiction. And that came yeah. out years ago. So. Yeah, well, 2000 AD did at least one in comic format, and there was a... Yeah, Dice Man comic, own. I think it was. That was the one, Dice Man, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right, lovely. Uh, so we'll move on to our next question. We've got one here from Creative Fossey um, about the process of, of writing stories then um, in terms of how do you, I mean, you've kind of alluded to the difference between one true path through or, or multiple endings. Um, mm. do, do you generally begin with your end or endings and then work back or do you uh, allow yourself a bit of organic creativity as you're writing from the beginning? When I, when I write novels, and I've not written one for a while now, but I will start at the beginning and I'll also know where it ends. And the tricky bit is working out how to get from A to B. <laughs> um, with game yeah. books, particularly because I'm doing ones which now quite often follow at least the bare bones of a plot that somebody else has created, I'm much more systematic in going through it. But uh, generally for any, any book I write, I start with one of these. So there's the notes for the next one. You know, just a classic notebook. I just make loads and loads of notes. And once mm. I've decided on a theme, I'll just kind of um, brainstorm it and different encounters you could have. So this one, um, oh, this is a probably a first. Uh, it's going to be called Judgment Day 1869. And although it doesn't follow the plot of an existing book, it features Mark Twain's characters a little bit grown up. So oh, it's nice. got um, Tom Sawyer as a sheriff and Huckleberry Finn as an outlaw. Uh, but that's mm. kind of by the by. It's that the rest of the story will be 
much much different but it's a weird western so i went away brainstormed anything i might want to put in a weird western and then i do i draw lots of flow charts and lots of maps hmm. to give it a basic structure and that's how i work now so i just do different levels of flow charts so i'll start off with something really basic like you know the opening scene like say final scene maybe a few different bits to visit in between then i'll break that down further and when it comes to writing a scene i'll draw out the flow chart before i write it when I started writing fighting fantasy books, I often wrote it and then drew the flow chart afterwards. But now I find it much better to do it the other way around. Even yeah. though it may change while I'm writing it, I might think actually that's, mm. I could do this differently or more efficiently uh, and make changes. But yeah, mm. so it's, and it is by hand. I'm, I'm old school. The only, I, I, type, I don't write it out by hand, which I used to do when I first wrote my books, but I now obviously type everything, but I don't use Twine. I don't use any other software. Mm. Um, yeah, handwritten notes, and then I just type it up on, in Word. Nice. Um, that's interesting. That, that, that's exactly how I, I plan on paper and then and then write on the computer yeah. as well. I'm exactly the same. I think it's a different process, something about the whole yeah. hand-eye connection, and it's just – although I find mm. handwriting much harder now than typing and much slower, it's still – for me, it's part of the process, and it's that kind of yeah. – I think maybe it just triggers in me that this is – thinking time and plotting time rather than necessarily creative writing time or that's being created yeah. in a different way I, so yeah, I people saying that you draw maps and generally uh, it's weird because judgment day will have a proper physical map of places you can visit but quite often that's not the case but the map is the encounters so mm. or it might be yeah. a place on the map might be the same physical place but at a different time or if you've done a different thing so yeah, yeah it's a flow chart really yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I think I think there's a spatial thing to doing it by hand as well. That that if you're thinking about something structurally, it's easier mm. for me yeah. to kind of yeah. do that spatially. But I yeah. don't know, Andy, as a cartographer, I'm pointing the wrong way. As a cartographer, um, mm. are you the same in terms of obviously you do your maps digitally, but you're drawing digitally, so it's I don't know. Much like my maps, which are now largely 100% digital, almost all my writing is 100% digital, um, and supplemented by walking. Um, I do most of my actual thinking and plotting and step-by-step -step processes as I walk. That that space between where I'm writing and actually doing something and just getting out there amongst whatever it is I happen to be walking through makes an enormous difference to where my mind is going. And I find I plot much, much better when I'm out there. And then when I sit down and discuss it out, it's all about the finer details and getting all those little nooks and crannies into place. But the overall pictures tend to be better out there. Um, but I am now completely digital. I do everything on my computer, um, absolutely everything. I use flow charts, I use spreadsheets, I use whatever tools happen to be to hand. And uh, yeah, completely fine on computer nowadays. Hmm. Yeah, just to stand separate to everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but, you, but you, even when you're using computers, though, you are often using inkable like you know, or tablets yes. and devices so that you, yes. you still have that tactile hand-eye thing. Um, so... There you have it. So I cheat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I think it's the way forward. I've got I have actually two inkable tablet sort of computers up there actually that I'm experimenting with for work. So yeah, I'm, I agree. Um, okay, we, we got a couple of very similar questions too. Actually, we got this one through from Seagoat um, about how you number the paragraphs or the mm. sections, um, and similar question from Kilachandra about organising the numbers as, as you write them. Um, and I guess I, I, that's a practicality question, something I have yeah. literally never thought about before. So I don't know if, if you want to yeah. speak to that. Mm. Yeah, I have. I've brought some um, some props with me. Um, <laughs> oh, well, I say brought with me. I've just picked my props. But um, yeah, so I love here's my. Uh, yeah, when I first write it, the first thing I start off with is I optimistically decide I'm only going to write 500 sections, and the last mm -hmm. couple of games have gone longer. But I will print out something like that. So I print up my list of numbers. Mm -hmm. And as I write it, I know this is very different from how uh, Surrey and Livingstone do it. And Steve Jackson does it a different way as well. But for me, this is what I do. So then section, the first section is section number one, which will turn to two and three, and they will go on so forth and so on like that. So I effectively write it just in order, not muddled up at all, mm -hmm. except that obviously it's got to have some element of being muddled up by its nature. So when I... As I'm doing it, I'll make a note of any section numbers, which when it's in the final book will need to be the solutions to puzzles or mm -hmm. items. Um, and then when I've actually finished it, 
I will then go through, and people are appalled I do this, but again, I do it all by hand. So I, I renumber everything. But oh, wow. um, there's somebody recently was, I was discussing them because they've written some software which you can write the game book into and it does all the muddling up for you. Mm, yeah. But when I started to outline actually what I need when I muddle something up, the, the computer program couldn't yet accommodate that because mm. I don't just randomize it. Uh, and again, I've become more refined as I've gone on. But one of the things which I do, which isn't the case of fighting fantasy books, but for my ace game books, is, um, well, all of them have illustrations and they're spaced evenly throughout. FF mm -hmm. does that, Lone Wolf does that, that's the same. But from mine, generally, if you see, if you look at the illustrations, they actually follow the story. So the mm. further through the book the illustration is, the closer, the further through the story you are. Right. Um, oh, I like that. And mm. then, so obviously I have to <laughs> accommodate those and I try and space them evenly, but also sometimes they might be the answer to a puzzle as well. Mm. I have to fit in all those other puzzle sections with the things like Dracula, Curse of the Vampire, which you can see is stupidly massively big. Um, <laughs> one of the things I do is that you have... I'm trying to find it now, icons. So if you get to a section, it doesn't say if you're this person, turn to this. But you know from the rules, there we go, there's one, that if you're a certain character, a certain icon belongs to you. And that mm -hmm. means you must subtract or add a certain number to that section and read your own section. So oh, I also have to oh, accommodate clever. that um, and make space for that in the book. And then the other thing I do, which I didn't used to do, is reading something like this, it's, it's difficult. So I actually try to make sure that when you turn from one section to another, you're not always jumping backwards and forwards. So you'll actually find, if you look, notice, that generally the sections are relatively close together for ease of reading and for ease of keeping your fingers in the pages. That's a big yeah. one. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, a big one, that's yeah. the question I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of, yeah. That's right. You run out of fingers. Yeah. Well, I, I took the opposite approach when I, I did mine. Here we are. Uh, Midnight Rogue. Fighting Fantasy 29. Yeah, I love that one. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, but I, I started out with a big grid of numbers, just as you did, uh, which, of course, had to be done by hand in those days. And uh, then I, uh, being a gamer, I had percentile dice and a D4, and I just randomly generated the number of the next uh, next section I was going to uh, to write and I crossed it off the grid and uh, it seemed to work but then you know when you've only got this many pages and there's only 400 uh, entries it's reasonably manageable and the other um, the educational game books I did were even smaller they were only 50 entries mm -hmm. so yeah. uh, I was I could surprised see that... not... sorry sorry Graham I'm just going to say I could see that system not scaling when you get up to something the size of your Dracula book. Yeah. It was interesting because there was one series which I was invited to write the first book for, and then mm. somebody else wrote the second one, and I did my usual muddling the sections up. And when I came to read their book, they hadn't. They did what I did at the first stage, so section one went to two and three. And obviously it doesn't really right. matter, and it especially mm. doesn't matter if it's an app because it's just an illusion in anyway. But I right. thought that was a bit weird personally. I didn't feel that that was quite the... Hmm. Quite the biscuit. I am horrified. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is that is shoddy work. Yes. Well, there weren't any more after the second one, so there you go. <laughs> um, horrified. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we've got another one here from Seagoat. Um, uh, first of all, acknowledging the complexity of what you do, saying that it seems hard. Um, and I suppose this is a question that may be best directed towards Graham, actually, someone mm -hmm. who was experienced in, in both fields here. Um, is it harder than writing an adventure scenario, which gives players different outputs depending on, on what they choose? Um, sitting uh, in the Venn diagram, Graham, I don't know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's a little more elaborate, but that, that was the approach I took because that's how I knew, that was the way I knew to write adventures. So, you know, I started mapping slash flow charting the whole thing, uh, just as if I were write, doing a dungeon map. And then uh, uh, I tried to think, well, you know, here's a junction point. What happens? A, B, here's a choice point, A, B. And uh, just flow charted it. Um, nowadays, I would use, I would definitely use something like Twine or Arqueef to do that. Uh, but uh, back in the 80s, I just used a very large piece of paper. <laughs> and I, I suppose what, one of the key differences you got there is the, 
is the degree of specificity um, mm -hmm. in the in a choose your invention that you need to be very precise about what happens depending on what they choose. Whereas yeah. for a tabletop scenario, you can you can leave a little bit of, of wiggle room for the GM to interpret it in the way that, that kind of fits them, or or a lot of wiggle room. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I, I, um, I think that's that's kind of one reason I've stayed so long with role playing adventures because it's it's really great for a lazy writer compared to fiction, <laughs> where you have to uh, you have to you know have someone make a choice or you have to allow a limited number of choices in the game book but you can just hand wave so much stuff and say you know you're the gm you sort it out yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh very good well i suppose a, a kind of follow-up connected question from roderick um is relating to to you know if we were going to try and use this kind of methods to to kind of write a supplement um it, is there a danger that it might become too railroady, or or are there ways for GMs and aspiring tabletop writers to to take what these kind of choose your adventure books do, but but transplant it into into the tabletop realm? Well, that's funny because um one of my game books I turned into a role playing game. So the fifth one is Twas the Krampus Night Before Christmas, which again uses characters from uh, Christmas legends and literature, but it's its own story. So the premise is that you hear a noise on Christmas Eve and you wake up, go downstairs, and you discover Krampus abducting Father Christmas while he's delivering presents to your house. Um, so I then turned that into a role-playing game. So obviously I based some of the scenes on what I'd written for the uh, game book, but I added a lot more um, so that it wouldn't be railroady. And again, trying to give different ways to solve the problem than I did in the game book. So even if you played the game book, you could still play the role-playing game and, and it would feel fresh. Um, mm -hmm. Graham, what do you think? Is um, well, I, writing it. <laughs> All right, Andy. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you're writing a, a, a role-playing game adventure, you're always kind of got one eye on the way through, and um, you know, unless it's a pure zoo dungeon, you've always got one eye on the plot and the way through and the way you would do it. Um, and to an extent, that kind of corresponds with the choices you get in a choose your own. It's sort of on a scale, you know, from a, a, a work of fiction where there's one way through to a choose your own, where there's multiple ways through to a tabletop role playing version where it's completely open. So I see it as more of a, a continuum. I, I think, uh, you know, railroadiness is kind of a slider that you can adjust in any format where there's interactivity. Yeah, I guess I, I if you wrote a very linear game book, people probably criticize you for that. But you can, yeah. it's like when you think so many role play games, from my experience of video games, are completely railroaded. But mm. it's what you can do within that zone or exploring or or the, the items yeah. you might pick up. So it's like Graham says, it's with the GM, it's the different, the crazy solutions that people can come up with, which I, mm. I, I read about sometimes on Facebook and things, just the most bizarre. But, you know, they've got, they make it work and it's completely unique. So even yeah. if you literally go from room A to B to C, you can make it a completely different adventure. Absolutely. With, with adventures, you've got yourself another storyteller. Um, with yes. game books and with novels, you have a single storyteller, and that's, that's the person it, exactly. that's writing the book. Mm. Um, but when you're writing an adventure, you're actually not the storyteller. You're presenting ideas to a storyteller who is now going to be presenting that, um, which means that as a medium, it has a host of different options in terms of writing it. Mm. Um, the core ideas, though, whether it's a railroaded direct story, whether it's a completely open one where you just present a location and things that happen mm. and there's no actual plot beyond the overarching potentials. Um, yeah. That's something that you can do in an adventure that you pretty much can't in a book because you're mm. passing yeah. over all responsibility of the storytelling to another party. Yeah. Um, but. Are there things that you can do? Absolutely, indeed. Many role-play games use Choose Your Own Adventures as their core. Um, take, for example, the recent starter set for RuneQuest. It's effectively got a Choose Your Own Adventure in it. Um, yeah. It's a, they, they now are saying solo adventures, but that runs back yeah. to, say, Tunnels, and, the tunnels and Trolls. Yeah, there Tunnels and Trolls yeah. did that back in the day. When yeah. I was the tiny the kid, fantasy um, trip, too. Yeah, um, you got that through. Or if you want advanced fighting fantasy, um, they were effectively... Uh, taking the, the, the steps away from using the game book and moving it into role play as well. But the mm. solo books from Tunnels and Trolls in particular are just choose your own adventures with a wider rule set. Yeah. Um, and they are being used to this day in multiple role playing games. Call of Cthulhu has got the same in, um, yeah. uh, with its recent starter set. So it's a medium that is continuing to be used right now in role playing games. Yeah. 
and uh, you know, talking about being being railroady, having worked in video games as well, um, the the art is not to avoid being railroady, but the the art is actually to disguise it so that people don't <laughs> don't notice that they're being railroaded. And I think yeah. that works across all media. True fact. <laughs> yeah. I, absolutely. Yeah. If you're going to pen a character into an area, make sure it feels organic. Not that you can randomly, yeah, you yeah. can climb that wall, but not that wall, even though there's yeah. no, no reason that you can't jump manipulate over that them. Time. Yeah. Manipulate them so they think that that's what they want. Yes. <laughs> sort of following on from that, some of the some reviews I read in the past about some of my own stuff, which was always really pleasing, were when they people say it feels like there's a world beyond the book. So it's mm. it gives that again that illusion that's that in the, theory yeah. you feel like you could go down a different mm. street and see something else, just the way you sort of slip in background material and not we enter a room and you just purely describe that and just things that people mention in passing or yeah, yeah, which that's, creates that that's illusion. That's like about the greatest compliment you can get as a writer is people mm. wanting to know more and explore further. Yeah, yeah agreed. Absolutely. Um, so uh, another question from Kilishandra here. Um, what was the most interesting innovation in game books that you've encountered or indeed to toot your own horn uh, created? Um, <laughs> no, no, no false modesty here. Um, yeah. uh, Goodness me, that's uh, stumped me. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, I've seen other game books which take other elements from elsewhere, uh, such as with Destiny Quest and and sort of video games and the maps that you can explore. Mm. Um, one day, I don't know when, but I want to write a, a book about game books, sort of history of game books, which would take particularly landmark books and what they did differently. Mm. So having said that, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to think of an example, but um, that's a tricky one. I mean, I, I, obviously with my own, it's become a feature. It's not in all of them, but where you can play as different characters, but that's not original. Mm. People have done that before. It's just how you execute it, I guess. So it's, it's, not, mm. it's not a new idea. Um, it, you know, again, you it's a good role playing game. I think it's a good one, one. Yeah, I think it's a good one. Well, well worth developing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely, thing, because obviously with Dracula, um, if you play as a vampire hunter, you really follow the course of the story. Um, mm. But if you play as Dracula, you're seeing it from the the villain's point of view, and that which is something that you don't see in the book. So things have to tie in, but also other things happen. So, for mm. example, um, quite a lot of the novel, Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula is off screen. Um, yeah, and trying to then think of a reason why he doesn't turn up and do something to sort out these characters. Another point: there's classic moments where, for example, Van Helsing goes to look at Lucy Westenra's tomb. Oh yeah, she's a vampire. We'll come back tomorrow night. It's like no, you wouldn't. You'd do something about it there and then. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like things like where then if you're Dracula, you run into other characters. So I don't want to give too much away, but when you're in London, there's a reason why you can't go and interact with the vampire hunters because you've got your own problems to deal with. Which is why, when you eventually catch up with them, they've you know, they've got the advantage at that moment. They've trapped wow. down your house while, while and your hiding place while you're not there. Um, so certainly for me, that's also one of the most satisfying things as a writer is yeah. exploring and reimagining um, those events. I guess, mm. yeah. yeah. So yeah, that doesn't really answer the question, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've seen other people do. It's becoming more of a thing now as well, where they produce sort of little packs of goodies. But yeah, I'm trying to think of one. Um, Alba, which I know has had some issues with, uh, as many companies have with getting the game printed and shipped and things. Mm. Um, but they have these little packs, quest packs, I think, which involve stickers, and which you can easily do with just a page. And mm. I, I think people enjoy that novelty, but it's something I haven't done myself yet because part of it is I feel if you buy the game, everything you need should be in the book. Even if you can then yeah. download mm. other adventure sheets so you don't write in the book. Yeah. In theory, everything you need, apart from maybe a couple of dice and the pencil, is there. Yeah, yeah, but that's a personal I, I agree. philosophy, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a thin line between innovation and gimmick, and I have a couple yeah. of examples of that. But um, I want to point out what Rango said uh, just now that um, Lone Wolf actually allowed you to advance your character yes. between books, and that was a significant innovation. Um, but yeah, there were gimmicks. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers the uh, the old famous five Enid Blyton adventure game books. 
and they they were enormously expensive because they came in a plastic sleeve with all these goodies i think there were special dice there were little tokens for ginger beer and cherry cake and, <laughs> hey! you know i'm not kidding it was uh, wow. it was almost a almost a parody in itself um <laughs> but uh, they had yeah all manner of plastic that came with them uh, i also remember i think it was a tsr series uh, they did more than one, uh, including the uh, horrendously ill-judged heart quest aimed at bringing girls into the hobby. Um, but they did one where uh, you had a little red cell filter that you could put over certain paragraphs that were greyed out and, uh, and decode hidden information and stuff like that. Actually, while Graham was talking, it reminded me that Fighting Fantasy published uh, Clash of the Princes, which oh is yes, the two player one, and I yeah. think Joe Diva did his own kind of um, dual I game. He did. Yeah. And they, they did, they approached it in different ways, but that's something which I haven't done yet with Ace Game Books, but I want to do, and I've got an idea for right. it and how I'll make yeah. it work. Um, which again, I'll bring yeah. a variation on the two. But yeah, because yeah, I guess that was an interesting one. Yeah, because there was a that was based on um, or the idea anyway. Uh, there was a series whose name I forget now, where uh, there were five or six books uh, with different fantasy tropes. You know, a warrior, a barbarian, an undead, a wizard, and you could you could you could mix them up and fight one against any against any because oh, okay. uh, the moves all corresponded. And there was a think, World yeah, War One so dog fighting was... game had the same sort of basic uh, premise. Because I think Joe D was were they Duel Masters or that was maybe another series, but um I, I think No, they... I think Duel Master was 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 Joe's title, but I yeah. can't remember the uh, the World War One or the fantasy ones. Yeah. But they were around and they were known at the time. Hmm. I'll do a quick answer that's completely different. I'm gonna do one that I don't like as an innovation. Um <laughs> and that's um in choose your own adventures in particular, and that's going digital. I love the digital games and I've played mm. many of them, and I think they work very well. But you can't do that very well. No. <laughs> and part of the joy of game books is being able to do that. And over the course of time, particularly with mid-time fighting fantasy books, there was a period where they tried to stop cheaters, hmm. um, where they did things such as, do you have this particular item? If you do, you know that number that's attached to the item because yeah. you've been to that yep. section. Ha! Yeah. Um, yeah. Or alternatively, have you picked up this particular Mm. There's various ways to avoid cheating. Yeah. Um, and they were ultimately for the kids who were enjoying them, blocks. Yeah. And often weren't popular because of that, even though they were very much designed around the idea of making the book more difficult and more fun because of that. Um, mm. But for many people who were just casually enjoying it, it made the books much less fun. Yeah. Um, so there we go. There's two examples of innovations that mm. I didn't enjoy as much. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, to take I a different didn't... angle. I did a couple of uh, of things to that effect in Midnight Rogue. By the time I got to the end of it, I had some spare entries that I hadn't used. So uh, rather than rejig the whole thing, I uh, wrote a couple of paragraphs that was, you know, uh, the treasure is in your hands. You have succeeded. Now turn to paragraph so and so. And when you got to paragraph so and so, it's like there's nothing that leads to that entry. You clearly just saw this and decided to take a shortcut. So start again, which was a little cruel. Uh, um, I, I did something similar with the Doctor Who game book I wrote because um, I left a couple of spare paragraphs effectively in case when they came to, to check it that there are any bugs and I maybe needed to rejig things. So I just had these few paragraphs, which are just a time loop and it goes backwards and forwards around all three of them. And yeah. because they never need to rejig it, they're still in the book. And one of the editors said, no, can't we link to this somehow? And I had to explain, no, it's just my placeholder. But if you read right. them, yeah, you can follow it just round and round and round. So. Yeah, that's funny. That's funny. Like that. and the sorry. other thing I did in Midnight Rogue, which wasn't really an anti-cheat thing. It was just kind of a way for me to keep control of the thing. The uh, It broke down into a number of sections. And when you succeeded at a section, you got a number. And mm -hmm. you ended up with three numbers, which if you put them together was the um the number of the paragraph you needed to go to to carry on to the finale of the game i'm not sure anybody else did that i'm still not sure it was a good idea but i, did. <laughs> I have also past memories sven, of, oh. uh, sorry sven harder he wrote um oh 
Rides the Black Sun, and he's done heavy metal heroes and things. He's a German game book author, but he divides his books into chapters because they're massively long as well. So within mm -hmm. each chapter, you'll only be turning to sections within that chapter. Right. I thought that's that's quite a nice idea. Oh, and, and again, you can look at the side of the book and see because it's marked like they do in dictionaries sometimes in encyclopedias. Right. Yeah. I don't have it to hand, but yeah. So that's that's quite a nice. Yeah, idea. it is. <laughs> I'll, I'll add one innovation that's not necessarily an innovation that any of us will immediately jump on, and that's um, visual novels in general, um, because mm -hmm. they're super, super popular, and they're effectively just choose your own adventures, but on computer, um, right. where you're following down what appears to be, for some of them, just a choose your own adventure style fixed story with a few choices, but for some of them, they are fully interactive, almost identical to fighting fantasy books or any of the broader game books. Mm -hmm. um, they have entire subsystems going on in the background. It might be friendship ratings, depending on the type of game that you're going for. Um, yeah. But again, they're the ones that could easily be duplicated in book form as well. But as an yeah. innovation, it's really nice because I think it's a potential route into and going back to game books as well. Um, yeah. Because they just train you into loving that type of game. Are you thinking yeah. like the like the Telltale games, Andy? Those kind of things. Um, that's another example. That's not the ones I was yeah. thinking. Of. I was thinking they're very popular in Japan, for example. There's all manner yeah. of different visual novels that you can get from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's interesting because that's clearly a successful adaptation. Yes. Whereas you know, as you were saying earlier, putting a fighting fantasy book in digital format unaltered doesn't work as well. It's not as satisfying. It's because you've got an expectation of a particular outcome and you can no longer follow those outcomes. So uh, take the right. sorcery games when they updated those. They made a lot of updates. So instead of going to paragraph numbers, you're moving your little counter across the maps. Mm. Um, it's doing the same thing, but it's different. Yeah. And that, that, to a degree, bridged the, the gap. So it mm. didn't feel like you were being cheated. Um, yeah. Where the games that directly replicated it, of which there's several, you just felt... Like it wasn't quite the right experience. Well, yeah. Tin Man must be, Games must be a done... reason for changing medium. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Tin Man Games who've done some adaptations of Fighting Fantasy, and they, they have their Fighting Fantasy Classics right. yeah. uh, app now. But they introduced bookmarks, and also after the first few releases, they then had difficulty levels. So mm. I think they, they've got ah, effectively nice. the cheaters, so you can have as many bookmarks as you want and pass all the tests. Then you've got your kind of standard, and I think they have a Livingstone version, which is the really hard. <laughs> no, no, yeah. Forever. no mercy yeah yeah and uh i was just reminded of another innovation since you mentioned sorcery andy um uh -huh. they ah, printed sorry. those two little dice rolls on the bottom of the page yeah. that so was the, nice yeah and there was another series i can't remember what it was now it might have been herbie brennan's grail quest um oh, forgotten about those yeah <laughs> uh <laughs> but wow. There was a there was a table in the back on the very back page, maybe even printed inside the back cover. This table of random numbers, and you're supposed to just sort of flip to that and stab. Yeah, uh, stab. another sort of effort to to make sure that the book was all you needed. You didn't even need dice. But I never mm -hmm. saw a terribly successful attempt to achieve that. I think that was done in Lone Wolf. Yeah, it was. I think. Table. Oh, it was Lone Wolf. Yeah, yeah, the ah, yeah. right. Yeah, the, the dice in um, Sorcery then got added to the main series when they were republished by Wizard and they're now in the Scholastic mm. books as well. Oh, lovely. The, nice. Yeah, speaking of Scholastic, they were still, I've seen the other day, they're, they're still doing uh, game books, choose your own, um, for you can take part in like Pearl Harbor and various other historical events as part of a history curriculum, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. Very and they've cool. got two new Fighting Fantasy books out this year for the 40th anniversary, of course. 40th? Which was announced oh, this year. Yeah. So, wow. um, Sir Ian's writing Shadow of the Giants and Steve Jackson's books called Secrets of Salamonis, or Salamonis, depending on how you pronounce it. Right. So. Nice. I spotted that now. A little childhood smile spread across <laughs> my face. Well, as yes. it would. Yes. Yeah. The it's years like, just oh. melt away. Yeah. Yeah. So rather than co writing one for the 40th, they've done one each. So. Nice. That's nice. That is nice. nice. That yeah, because nice. I was in, always interested. I, I loved seeing their different approaches. You know, Steve was always pushing the envelope. He did an SF one. He yeah. introduced the magic system in sorcery. Uh, you know, whereas uh, Sir Ian was uh, always refining, making them more difficult, more elaborate, uh, perfecting the, the core, as it were. That was interesting. I've never met them really to more speak more than half a dozen words, but I imagine that gives an interesting insight into their personalities. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
Um, so this next question m might have something perhaps to do with the T-shirt that you're wearing, uh, John. <laughs> um, do That's game books receive the yeah. same attention as other gaming? For example, are there any good conventions focusing on game books? Hmm. <laughs> well, there's the Irregular Fighting Fantasy Fest, um, <laughs> which we'll be holding again on Saturday, the 3rd of September this year to mark 40 years of Fighting Fantasy game books. Um, the weekend before is actually the actual anniversary of the publication of the Warlock of Far Top Mountain. And mm -hmm. then, so we've got something happening on that day online, and then hopefully have a week of sort of things filtering through until the fest on the Saturday. On the mm -hmm. Friday night, if anybody's coming along, we do a charity pub quiz as well. So we always mm -hmm. try and raise money for some funds linked to something to do with um, the community. So this year, nice. it's actually going to two charities because sadly in the last couple of years, we've lost, lost two popular fighting fantasy artists, Martin McKenna and Chris Achilles. Yeah. So we're splitting the money between the Martin McKenna uh, charity, which is to help disadvantaged kids have access to art, and the British Heart nice. Foundation in memory of Chris. So nice. there'll probably be other collections during the weekend as well. But yeah, mm. so we'll have Stephen Inn will be there, um, other authors and artists as well as you know, traders. There'll be um, all sorts of things going on during the day, panels, other stuff which we haven't announced yet, and tickets will hopefully go on sale by the end of the month. So nice. I have two questions about Fighting Fantasy Fest. Uh, yes. Firstly, where is it being held? Oh, good point. It's actually at the University of West London in Ealing, so St Mary's Road. So it's very close to Ealing Broadway Tube, which is mainliners, well, mainline station as well. And we're not nice. that far from Heathrow, so it's good access from the M4, the M40, the M3. You know, what are the chances? Right, you are. <laughs> and so, yeah, London, question, mostly. <laughs> London, right. And the it's second London. question is, is there a, an online component for people who can't make it in, in person? We're hoping to do some streaming. We haven't done streaming before, but, yes, mm -hmm. that is the intention this year. Although, as with previous years, we have people videoing the talks, which then go up on YouTube. So if you weren't able to be there, uh, you can oh, watch it nice. that way as well. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah. So I think the answer to Killer Chandra's question is yes. 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 <laughs> there's, there's one. This is the one to come to because, you know, it's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Be honest, so, you know. <laughs> so on that question of popularity then, we, and this also I think overlaps a little bit with solo RPGs that we talked about, but um, mm. have you seen a shift in the popularity of that since the pandemic and everything um, as people's normal social gaming groups perhaps got disrupted? Were they more inclined to take up solo play? Um, I don't know. I think if people enjoyed game books before, they probably indulged in them more than they had before. But obviously, there were various, you know, with Zoom and Teams, there were other ways that people found they could get together to to role mm -hmm. play. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, I've you know I've run a couple of Kickstarters since the pandemic, and even though people maybe had a tough time, um, you know, with furlough and whatever might happen to their jobs, but they've still funded. I'm pleased to say, so I'm very grateful to the people who backed them. So there are still people who definitely want more material. Mm. Um, but I, it seems to me that there's just a general... It's, it's Going back to what we said earlier about a lot of schools and people didn't push game books because they were fantasy. Fantasy yeah. has become mainstream in the last 40 years. It has. Yeah. And it feels that gaming is becoming more mainstream and particularly yeah, what, what we might call geek gaming um, <laughs> yeah. with particular celebrities. And they're not afraid to talk about it either. So it just becomes yeah. natural. It's not seen as being something weird. Uh, and it's yeah. you know it's out there. Things like Stranger Things, which is massively popular, oh, always yeah. has some element of geek culture in there. From there, you know, the fact they even mm -hmm. name the monsters after the D and D creatures they're fighting. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think probably just carried along with that. But it's it's interesting how many people still you might you might you know posted about fighting fantasy so many times, and still somebody will be the first time they've seen that. I go, oh, I remember those books. Mm. Um, the other thing I have found is that. Uh, Graham mentioned Lone Wolf had the character who, who progresses through the adventures, which was a, a great idea. Fighting Fantasy were kind of self-contained adventures, although there were some sort of sequels as well. And Sorcery, again, carried on the same character. Mm -hmm. um, but I kind of feel I shot myself in the foot with Ace Game Books because each one is completely different. It's a different genre. It's a different mm -hmm. setting. There's no continuing characters. But I have found that because they are existing properties that people know, I've had people pick them up who've never played a game book or played an RPG oh, yeah. before, yeah. and they love them. So the first one was based on Alice in Wonderland. It was Alice's Nightmare in Wonderland, and that's right. still it's probably the bestseller, and it's 
in 10 different countries around the world now as well so mm. um, yeah yeah speaking of, of different countries you know obviously the home of fighting fantasy in particular is the uk um but i've had uh oh see i got a japanese one here and a danish one and a, a hebrew one yeah oh, nice. uh, <laughs> but i have the feeling which may be wrong at the time it never seemed to crack america um you know whether choose your owns really reign supreme do you yeah. think that's still the case or uh has i, I do got better? Um, and also choose co is now a company and they still publish new choose and adventure material and right. original books um so, so i think you're absolutely right america had those and i do have some very loyal backers from the states who still mm. enjoy them and there are there are a lot of fighting fantasy fans in the states but i think you're right and fighting yeah. fantasy did have a wider reach as you say into kind of everywhere else it felt like and then the states right. were left alone. um i mean they're huge in brazil for example yeah um, it, yeah. ian went to an event a couple of years ago you know and it was hundreds of people queuing up every day mm. to meet him you know stacks of books which he signed it was incredible oh, uh, nice. also i find that for me personally germany has actually been a really good good market and they've right. only brought a couple of books so far which is quite nice so that's manticore mm. verlag um right but, but yeah i think you're right the states they kind of had their own thing and because it was first it was kind of everywhere yeah so yeah fight against, you had to fight against that yeah you know and having lived in the states for quite a while now uh i talk to people about fighting fantasy and it's very rare that anybody's heard of them before mm -hmm. yeah, yeah i just to talk to the popularity it's one of the things that struck me with first book when you pour over it as a child mm. um printed seven times um in the same year reprinted seven times yeah same year. yeah and that's marked in the book and they're like yep we're still going and it's still that year so there's probably right. multiples it was going gang was mad. Back yeah then. yeah it really was um yeah, was and obviously as a child that was super exciting yeah yeah, yeah. i think it's mean, like 350 000 copies yeah. is that in the first year or i mean it, that, you know, it was crazy yeah numbers. it was ridiculous numbers yeah so I, I, mean, I kind of feel death trap dungeon is the quintessential game book which makes sense because yeah. the issue you have is you know you're, you're in a forest and you fight this monster you go around the corner there's another apex predator you fight that one you know down the lane there's some terribly powerful sorcerer whereas death trap dungeon had you know it's the logic of why would there be so many terrible monsters right. so closely together so. <laughs> exactly yeah yeah um I, I I just I had a flashback there, and I remember we were talking before about them being libraries and things. When I was at school, we they weren't in our school library, but they were mm -hmm. almost like um, almost like trading cards with us in that we we had them, yeah. and then and then we would swap them with each other. And I, I'd entirely forgotten that there was an entire community of about yeah. eight, maybe eleven or twelve. I think it's a real word of mouth thing, and of course, if you can get word yeah. of mouth, it's still the best advertising there is. Oh, yeah. and, absolutely. And and you would all and you would make one. Oh, you've got that one. Well, well, I'll get this yeah. one. And when I've done yeah. it, we can swap, and then we would, yeah, yeah. I know people whose families where they you know somebody, and I think it was Martin Gooch, uh, the film director. They and he and his brother were both into them, but rather than the parents buy them, you know, they Martin's got this one, his brother's got that one, then they'd have to swap. <laughs> so, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and one thing you kind of alluded to there was was the idea of you know writing the, these kind of books for an established property that might bring people who are fans of the of that IP into this um and obviously you've worked on on a few including doctor who like, are there any ips that you haven't worked on that you think would <laughs> lend themselves to quite a good um sort of adventure book? i i would love to write um a batman game book personally no. and uh something like judge dread or something from the worlds of 2000 ad right so yeah, yeah. They, they would be the ones. <laughs> mm. I think both of those would be very popular. So internet, so get, get yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, I mean, I think thinking about it, like I'm amazed there haven't been more. It seems uh, like something Marvel and DC would attempt to. The back of the old better. Batman role play game, how to yeah. choose your own adventure. Yeah. Mm. Ah. Yeah. The old role play yeah. game. Um, that, yeah. had, that was the Mayfair one, as I recall. Yeah. Um, we it, mentioned, it wasn't very um, many entries. Yeah. It was there. You mentioned Marvel, and of course, Aconite Books are bringing out their uh, multiverse missions. The first one, first two are You Are Not Deadpool and She Hulk Goes to Murder World. So <laughs> they are coming out later this year. So I have to see what yeah, happens right. today as well. Oh, yeah. good. The They're Deadpool quite... one, particularly, I could see you having a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> with all the fourth wall breaking anyway, like 
Yeah, you, yeah. you could. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, um, Al Ewing's already written the comic "You Are Deadpool," so he's done a, a game book as, as a, I think it's a four issue mini series, which has been released as a, a collected trade nice. paperback or graphic novel, I think. Hmm. Terrific. All right, very good. Well, that has, believe it or not, taken us to the end <laughs> of our of our time. That has been already. Go on. Yeah. Um, I'm just frantically scrolling through my banners. It's the first time I've done this end bit. Uh, so um, thank you to everybody who has tuned in and kind of watched uh, watched along with us live, um, and indeed to people that are watching up uh, watching it on catch up. Um, if you have enjoyed what we do and you like what we're doing inside the rookery, please do check out our Patreon. Um, we do appreciate each and every one of you who does back us. Um, and I guess all that remains for me to say um, is a final thank you to my fellow Rooks, Andy and Graham, and indeed to Jonathan. Uh, buy, his books. buy his and, books. Uh, and yeah, buy, buy his, his books. Buy his books. Um, buy his, his, books. Links, <laughs> his links will <laughs> pop up as the kind of outro goes. So if you've not got any links yet, they will, they will be on your screen as we check yep. out. Um, and we will see you <laughs> next week for another episode of Inside the Rookery. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.